So I guess my current obsession is lunar regolith dust. How are we going to deal with dust on the moon and on Mars? They are wiping out spacecraft. They are definitely going to be serious concern when humans go to either of these worlds. What are we going to do about it? So my guest today is Ian Wells. He is a cryogenics researcher at Washington State University, and he is working on a technology with other people that will spray liquid nitrogen at some kind of fabric or material that's coated in lunar regolith. And what they found was that it is vastly more effective in removing lunar regolith from material than like using a brush and causes almost no damage to the equipment. And so you can imagine some future where the astronauts enter an airlock, they're sprayed down with liquid nitrogen to remove all of the regolith before they enter the station. It's a really clever idea. And it's kind of amazing how well this works compared to other strategies. And it might even be the solution for dealing with the dust on Mars or maybe the Holland that's on your car. All right, here's the interview with Ian Wells. So this has got to be a first. I, I record an interview with somebody about some topic in space astronomy, and another researcher pops in uh, into the comments and says, you reference my work. Uh, why don't you interview me? So that's the best. So I'm going to interview you now. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna open with the f the same question that I opened actually with uh, my other interview, which was like, how bad is the dust on the moon? So the lunar dust poses a lot of problems, as the uh, previous guest mentioned. Um, there's a lot of issues, uh, as she mentioned, with the thermal. Uh, the thermal topics where the dust actually begins to insulate and uh, as it coats these materials. Um, the research that I've been doing primarily focuses on the impact of uh, the uh, dust on degrading materials. So uh, for example, uh, if you're looking at a spacesuit uh, and you get the lunar dust on it, you end up having the dust either stuck in the spacesuit where it can later uh, enter a habitat and potentially the astronaut's lungs, but um, you also end up degrading the fabric and the seals on your spacesuit, which means that in the future, those seals might not seal correctly, uh, making the spacesuit uh, not usable, uh, or you could potentially even wear a hole in it, um, or in some of those outer layers that protect the astronauts from the very, very harsh conditions of space. Um, so it's nasty stuff. And do we have like a sense of how nasty, like, like I think about an astronaut going to the moon there, you know, and for maybe a long term space station, they're going to be there for the better part of, say, a year, they're going to have to go out and collect samples on a regular basis in their in their spacesuit, vastly more than just the the couple of spacewalks that the that the astronauts and the Apollo missions did. A year of putting on your spacesuit, going outside, collecting samples, coming back in, taking it off. Do we have a sense of of how bad that the regolith is going to be on the spacesuits? Yeah, so I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head of how much would get tracked into a potential habitat, but it would be significant. Um, the dust is electrostatically charged. Um, uh, there's the solar wind coming in. Uh, on the moon and without an atmosphere, uh, it actually ends up charging a lot of those particles. Um, so what's interesting is on the previous missions, they noticed that uh, some of those particles are actually just floating above the surface, levitating because the charge is so high. Um, but what happens is when you have things uh, that move into that environment that don't have the same charge, uh, you get a, uh, you can think of it like a static cling um, it's much more powerful than the static here on Earth, but um, you end up having this static that attracts dust to any open surface. Um, there are pictures from the Apollo missions where you can see that the suits are just absolutely coated in this dust. Um, moving that into the habitat would be very detrimental to the astronauts' health as well as some of the systems in there. Um, there's 
I guess there's a lot of debate right now about what the exact effects of the dust on people are. But um, I know that there's a few studies out there that even indicate that it can um, produce DNA degradation uh, in addition to being toxic to human cells. uh, And that's just um, that isn't even accounting for the very, very sharp, abrasive nature that can do some serious damage to your lungs. So. Um, even a little bit of exposure to this stuff is uh, not good, and it, um, it should be mitigated as much as possible. But uh, but I'm thinking about like you know you're going to have say your glove, and the glove is going to have this bearing system that allows you to turn your glove in the vacuum of space. The dust is going to get into that into that joint, into that bearing system and make its way down into the bearings, you know, no matter how well sealed the whole system is, the dust is going to find a way in. So do, right. do we have a sense like, you know, if you built a spacesuit, and you just like the kind of spacesuit that that's planned for say the Artemis mission, and you had the astronauts spend a year using those suits, can you think they could rely on them over the course of a year? Or is it like a major redesign necessary? Yeah, so one of the things that they're looking into right now uh, is some uh, dust-tolerant mechanisms, especially for those bearings. Uh, one, some of the problems with previous spacesuits are uh, the more rigid legs. Uh, if you look at some of the old Apollo footage, uh, you can see that the astronauts are kind of bunny hopping across the surface because they don't have great mobility. Um, so having that freedom of uh, movement will allow people to do a lot more up on the moon. Um, I know that one of the big focuses of the uh, XEMU program was making um, these more mobile spacesuits. And um, to my knowledge, uh, that information has been handed over to Axiom Space, uh, which uh, they're working to make these uh, systems more dust tolerant and more able to withstand that environment. But you're right. It's definitely a... Uh, big problem. I'm not sure how they're going to make it uh, dust tolerant, if it'll be uh, systems that maybe need to be changed out, or if there's going to be some sort of integrated cleaning mechanism or some sort of external cleaning mechanism. If I had to guess, it would probably be some combination of these passive, active, and then, you know, just um, they're probably going to try to minimize how much they're throwing away. But as a last resort, being able to interchange these parts. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then I'm thinking about that abrasion, like it's like sandpaper and you're going to be rubbing against the spacecraft. You're going to be walking around. You're going to be picking stuff up, using your tools. This stuff's going to going to wear down. Do you right. again, do you think like the I mean, I guess it's like how thick do you want to make the spacesuit? But do you see it abrading? pretty significantly as, as people are using these spacesuits? Yeah. So uh, one of the findings from my recent publication actually was uh, analyzing, um, uh, I guess, comparing the uh, lunar dust mitigation solution that my team has used compared with the Apollo mission one, which um, they just used a brush. They brought mm-hmm. just a uh, bristled brush and uh, tried to remove dust from their suits. Um, not only did it not work, but it did seriously abrade their spacesuits. So um, they did see a lot of these issues where um, some of the outer layers, outer protective layers, uh, such as like the micrometeoroid fabric, um, were being worn away. And that poses some serious health concerns and safety risks. Um, there are solutions. Uh, I've haven't seen a degradation study from a lot of other uh, solutions, but I know that uh, the liquid nitrogen based one that we use um, showed very minimal degradation. So there are over 75 trials. Um, we saw equivalent or less uh, degradation to fabric than using a brush once. So you'd be able to do 75 spacewalks as opposed to just one. Mm -hmm. uh for an equivalent amount of degradation so let's get into that then so your so how does your solution work so it's actually a fairly complicated answer um we uh i mean this is rocket science and you're on the moon every answer is going to be complicated yeah (laughs) um so 
we are using liquid nitrogen, which is sprayed uh, through a spray nozzle at a uh, surface. Um, what's happening is a combination of different effects. And we actually don't fully understand how those uh, effects are interplaying. We don't know how much each of those effects is contributing. And we're actually trying to get uh, some future work completed to investigate that and then be able to optimize that so you can actually put this on the moon. But what's happening is we have liquid nitrogen. It's being sprayed at the surface. Upon contact, uh, it's a very, very cold liquid. It's a, a, about 77 Kelvin. And uh, it interacts with a very hot surface uh, at room temperature. It experiences something called uh, the Leidenfrost effect, also known as film boiling. So uh, this effect uh, means that the gas that's evaporating off of the liquid actually begins to insulate the liquid. So you end up, uh, you can think of it as akin to uh, if you're cooking on a really hot stove and you put water uh, in a pan, it'll kind of form these little droplets that skitter around and don't really want to evaporate. That's when you know you can start your pancakes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the same thing is happening with uh, liquid nitrogen at room temperature. Um, so we are experiencing these little droplets on the surface, uh, and they are actually picking up the dust, and then they move to the lowest point on the surface, effectively removing it. Um, but one of the other things that's happening is that before this film boiling can take place, we're shooting this liquid nitrogen at very high velocity, at the fabric uh, or at the surface. So that energy has to go somewhere. And a lot of it is going into boiling. Uh, it's something called a uh, blevy, uh, B-L-E-V-E. -E. I believe, oh, I can't remember the acronym off the uh, top of my head. It's um, boiling liquid evaporation vapor explosion. extraction. The explosion. last one is explosion. Okay, so all right. I remember that. Um, so what's happening is the liquid hits uh, the surface and instantly turns into a vapor expanding. Uh, in this case for liquid nitrogen, um, at least in room pressure, uh, over 700 times. Uh, and this is removing, it, it's blowing the dust off the surface. Um, and that actually ties into some of our interesting results. So we tested our... Uh, solution in a ambient environment. So just kind of room temperature, room pressure. Uh, and we got very high removal over 95%. But then we put it in a vacuum chamber and we saw even higher removal. Uh, so what that means is, um, one, we're very far from steady state. At steady state, liquid nitrogen would not exist in the uh, environment we tested in. But two, the... Uh, the uh, liquid is expanding potentially even more in a vacuum um, because there isn't the uh, pressure of the atmosphere uh, pushing on it, uh, preventing it from expanding. So I mean, that's good news because then you can have a lunar environment, a vacuum, you can spray it down with the liquid nitrogen. You, it's not going to go in the air. It's just going to travel like projectiles around into your chamber maybe you you know you have a shower outside that you that you clean the stuff off and you don't have to worry about it the air going from the airlock into the into the capsule so that that sounds like that's all that's all good news i'm guessing having a source of liquid nitrogen that you can spray at astronauts on the moon whenever you need is going to be a challenge yeah so that is one of the challenges um Looking at the International Space Station, they already have a supply of nitrogen. Um, you can't make an atmosphere out of uh, just oxygen uh, without posing some serious flammability uh, concerns. Um, so they use nitrogen to make the uh, environment a lot more inert, uh, a lot less reactive, and uh, you have less uh, chance of blowing up your moon base. Um, so we were guessing that there would already be nitrogen on a moon base following that precedent set by the ISS. Um, you can actually then 
pump the nitrogen to the cold areas of the moon, those permanently shadowed regions, and liquefy it. Some of those uh, regions can get as low as 20 Kelvin. Um, so you could potentially take this nitrogen, liquefy it with very, very low energy consumption, and then route it back to a lunar habitat. That's really cool. I had never thought about that, that you could just run it in pipes into the area and then it gets cooled down for you by the moon and then you you bring it back. Another advantage to setting up near those permanently shadowed craters. Um, so what do you sort of imagine, like you were able to do these tests, you're able to remove the dust. If this was like an actual production system that the astronauts would be using, how do you sort of envision the whole system coming together? So there's a couple of systems that we, or a couple of system designs that we've looked at. Um, a lot of them are actually implemented in a airlock. Uh, we thought that um, it poses a lot of synergies with airlock pressurization. So if you're spraying this nitrogen, um, you can actually speed up the airlock pressurization, uh, clean your suit, uh, and then reuse the nitrogen. You wouldn't lose it to the vacuum of space. Um, so this could range anywhere from just being a sprayer to potentially having, a, uh, I guess you could have like a handheld sprayer, like a garden hose. Uh, you could have something more akin to a car wash where it's automated um, or potentially even like a car wash with some sort of um, imaging system that lets you identify dusty spots. Um, or you could even uh, incorporate a vacuum into it. So you spray it off with the liquid nitrogen and then pick it up with the vacuum. Um, so there's a lot of solutions uh, there that pose synergies with airlock pressurization. Um, there's also a lot of uh, opportunities for use on the surface. So there are, uh, you could imagine like a inflatable habitat where you have some amount of liquid nitrogen that you're able to use um, and potentially carry or have a cart that holds the bottles. Um, and then you put whatever you want to clean inside of this little uh, pop-up box, uh, spray it down, and then you can deflate your pop-up box. Um, so there's a lot of uh, different opportunities, um, especially looking at reusing those resources I, I think um, that's going to be one of the key features uh, that everything going to the moon needs to address. And and so you've got this, I like this idea of like a car wash. So the astronaut comes into the airlock, the airlock runs some kind of cleaning routine that is spraying them with nitrogen to get rid of all of the spots, maybe can even identify places and, and hits the, you know, the nozzles a little harder in those in those areas. Mm -hmm. It's carrying away the dust at the same time, it's pressurizing the airlock so that they can be prepared to go into the into the main station. What happens to the dust? Yeah, so um, as previously mentioned with the Blevy, uh, some of the dust is kicked up into the air. Um, this isn't a uh, problem that's unique to this technology, but it is definitely a problem. Um, there are a lot of solutions out there for removing dust from air once it's removed from the surface. Uh, there's air filtration techniques. Um, there's also a lot of uh, potential for electrostatic solutions um, on uh, surfaces. Um, but for the dust that's picked up by the droplets, it actually just gets moved down to the bottom of the airlock. So you could imagine um, that the astronaut is standing on some sort of grid, uh, uh, some sort of plate, and um, the dust and the liquid is able to fall through uh, to a lower surface where uh, the dust collects. So we've talked about the moon, but I'm sure your imagination has gone to Mars as well. What do you think that it would take to apply this technology on Mars? Is it going to work right out of the box? Yeah, so the Martian environment does also have a dust problem. Um, we've seen that with a lot of the rovers that we've sent up there. And um, unfortunately, a lot of the solutions that have uh, been tried uh, to um, mitigate the dust up there, uh, at least for the rovers, um, they've helped. But uh, in the end, uh, the dust has won. Um, 
So I, I think that there's definitely a lot of potential solutions uh, for implementing this uh, lunar technology on Mars. Um, I, I think um, at least for the people that are NASA fans, uh, that's been a big theme of the Artemis missions is kind of developing a lot of tech and a lot of uh, infrastructure for the moon in order to enable travel to Mars. Um, I know one of the things that they're trying to do is uh, use the uh, moon as a sort of pit stop or a gas station for rockets. Um, so, um, I yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity for technology transfer. Um, one of the things that we're looking at with our future testing, um, besides testing in uh, this uh, higher vacuum uh, with better uh, imaging of what's actually happening, um, we're looking at testing with Martian simulants, uh, so Martian dust simulants. Um, there's actually a couple out on the market. I know your previous guest um, mentioned that, you know, these things you can actually just go out and buy, um, which is pretty wild, honestly. But um, yeah, there's a, a lot of unique challenges posed there, uh, and they're they're pretty different than the moon. Um, I know that uh, the Mars doesn't have much of an atmosphere, but it has much more than the moon. Um, so you don't have as much of this uh, uh, triboelectric charging effect uh, causing the dust to adhere. Um, but it is still, uh, it, there's the lack of water making um, a lot of the dust still very sharp and abrasive. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of potential there. I mean, someone described it to me that the the dust on Mars is kind of similar to pollen. Like when you think about like in the spring when your car gets covered in pollen and you try just wiping it away and it doesn't work, like you, you need water to scrub the pollen away. And once you add the water, then suddenly the stuff comes clean and, and goes. So, so again, can you imagine that you're, you've got a Mars base and one of the astronauts job is to go out and hose down the solar panels with liquid nitrogen? Is, does that like some kind of sprayer that they've got? Is that, is that a possibility you think? Yeah, that would be a really cool future uh, to be living in is, uh, you know, using these uh, technologies in such a mundane way, even uh, as just hosing things down that, it, yeah, I, it, uh, <laughs> okay. it definitely excites me, uh, all, all right. the potential opportunities. Or, or, there. or like some, I mean, I can't even imagine how this would work on a rover, but some way that it could have a, like some, I guess, like, how do you keep the liquid nitrogen on board the rover so that it can spray down its panels? But I guess, like, do you think that the same technique would work? Like, if you hit the Mars, if you were if you were there and looking at the InSight rover and you had a liquid nitrogen supply and you hosed it down, would it clean off the dust? So my gut instinct is yes. Um, I think it would depend on uh, what parts uh, we're talking about. There are going to be some parts that uh, you can't get as cold um, for fear of uh, embrittlement or something like that. Um, but my gut instinct would be yes. Uh, we've done some testing on fabric and we've also done some testing on substrates, uh, but we're looking forward to doing some testing on metal materials and just kind of a wide range of materials to see what it works on. Um, on the pollen topic, um, something that I just remembered from your previous interview, uh, you mentioned, uh, the Mount St. Helens eruption. Um, so we actually ended up using, uh, a lot of the ash from Mount St. Helens as a lunar dust simulant. Um, it turns out that it has many of the same properties, including those small, sharp, glassy particles. Um, I go to Washington state university and, uh, they have a bunch of these barrels of the ash that's been preserved since the eruption uh, for over 40 years now. Yeah, all of us in the Pacific Northwest have a jar of Mount St. Helens material because it was everywhere. Yeah. So you can think of that as uh, very similar to moon dust. Um, we actually tried uh, removing it with water first just to see how it compared with liquid nitrogen. And we saw that um, the water, um, as well as compressed air, 
uh, would only remove about 60% of it um, versus the liquid nitrogen was removing much more. And my gut instinct would be uh, similar with pollen. I, I guess that's the next test. That's the next paper is is bring in stuff that's got pollen coated on on someone's car window and see if you can remove it. I have I've, that's one last question that I realized I kind of forgot, and you sort of reminded me when you were talking about if there'd be any danger to the rover. Would there be any danger to an astronaut who is wearing their spacesuit in the middle of a stream of liquid nitrogen? So if you were in the liquid nitrogen stream for a very long time, yes, there would be some danger. Um, the cleaning is actually characterized by really poor heat transfer um, between the liquid and the surface. That's what's causing the uh, lead and frost effect, that film boiling to occur. Um, you don't have very much of that uh, heat uh, going from the surface to the liquid. Um, so in theory, no. Um, but that's something that we are looking forward to uh, testing. Um, testing at what temperature uh, your spacesuit would need to start at, as well as um, if, if you have so many layers of spacesuit, um, what is the temperature on either side of that look like before and after cleaning? Um, and, I, and I can imagine there would be like points where the cold is conducting through the metal and, and getting closer to the, to the skin. So that would be just a matter, I guess, of, of tests until you find out what are the limits based on a current spacesuit. Right. And I know one of the design parameters for the spacesuits is to be able uh, to handle uh, temperatures between plus and minus 300 Fahrenheit. Um, you don't have very much uh, material to do conduction or convection with uh, in the vacuum of space. And so you get these very large temperature extremes between the light and the dark side of the moon. Um, and so you, uh, ideally, uh, these spacesuits are already, uh, mm -hmm. cold tolerant. Yeah. It's interesting. I did an interview with an astronaut and he was saying that although they are tolerant, they're designed to work in sunlight. They're designed to work in, in shade. You really feel it. And he was saying that he was working on the station and there was a point where they knew that he was going to fall under the shadow of one of the solar panels. And they told them the to, down to the second, okay, in 13 seconds, you're going to go into slight shade, and you're going to feel it. And he what he said, like, I just I wasn't prepared, because all the work I'd done up to this point had always been in the sunlight. And then there was this one moment where I was in shade for just a couple of minutes. And it was it was quite something that it just went from this warmth from the sun to this deep chill. So it would be interesting to see sort of when you're what the spacesuit's tolerances are and if you are spraying it down with nitrogen. Yeah, it's fascinating. Right. And especially to the thermal shock there too. You you have um just very large temperature gradients over very, very small distances. Um so you can imagine standing uh half on the light side of the moon, half on the dark side. What, what is that going to do to the spacesuit? What is that going to do to the person? Um, I, I think uh, going back to the moon and then on to Mars, we'll be learning a lot um, about how to live uh, in space as well as a lot more about uh, what it, how we can actually use those solutions here on Earth. Yeah, it's, it's amazing to me just like the mind just boggles at the details that are required to figure this out. Like you're literally figuring out how to get rid of dirt and that is, you know, potentially cancer causing equipment grinding, destructive dirt. And that's just one tiny little piece of the thousands of issues that people are going to have to sort out when we travel in, into space. Space is really trying to kill us. Uh, well, Ian, absolute <laughs> pleasure talking to you. And again, thank you so much for noticing the interview, jumping in, reaching out, and we're able to sort of bring the whole thing full circle. Good luck with your research. Thank you, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. It's been a pleasure. You can get even more space news on my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word, there are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at university.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the University Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at university.com slash podcast, or search for University Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. 
A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent and keeps ads at a bare minimum. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to just Paul Davis, Vlad Shipelin, Jay Dennis, David Giltanen, Modso, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbioff, Andrew M. Gross, and Josh Schultz who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.